I actually have a scripture verse, just one, but I'm going to tie it all together uh, as we uh, worship. The scripture comes from John 12, uh, verse 1. But to all who receive him, and, uh, but to all who receive him, who, oh, well, I lost it here. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God. So I'll read that one more time. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God. Well, the introductions uh, have been given uh, this morning, and I'm going to tie a little more of introducing myself to you all. But uh, I want to thank Brian Beeks uh, for allowing me to have this opportunity to be here with you and to worship today. And I also uh, am grateful that uh, I was al- allowed or permitted to uh, baptize Charlie uh, be one of the high points of my life uh, from now on. So that was a joyous and great opportunity for me to do that. And I want to thank you all as a congregation for the covenant that you made uh, with the family in terms of living your lives in such a way until such time that Charlie could choose for herself Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, in order to identify myself, uh, it would be easy for you all to make the connection uh, that, uh, well, I'm Mindy Gutwein's dad. So, okay, uh, I, get, we, I get that. That's, that's one way of identifying myself. Another way would be to say I'm John Gutwein's father-in-law. And then I'd uh, add to that, don't hold that against me. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I celebrate uh, the fact that, that John uh, is my son-in-law. And then mainly today, one of the ways of describing who I am is uh, Charlie's grandpa. How about that? That's an awesome thing. It's our first grandchild. And I came to the conclusion that, that Charlie is the most beautiful grandchild in all of the world. And if you want to argue about that, just ask Kay and Brad if she's not the most beautiful grandchild in the world. I uh, talked with um, Betty Kelly on the phone this week. She, of course, is the secretary here. And I talked with her, and uh, she said, well, you're entitled to, to say that Charlie's the most beautiful grandchild uh, in the world. And as a matter of fact, she said, you're expected to say that as a grandparent. And so I rejoice uh, in the gift of uh, Charlie as being a part of our lives and also a part of this church family. Additional background, I was a United Methodist minister for 28 years. And then uh, I became extremely physically ill. That was about four or five years ago. And I had a diseased pancreas. And because I had the diseased pancreas, uh, I could no longer serve full-time in the local church. And uh, eventually, I had my pancreas surgically removed. I had uh, nearly uh, died a half a dozen times, quite literally, in battling with with this diseased pancreas. And uh, I had my pancreas uh, surgically removed, and I had about a 2% chance of survival or, or of living. So that's one in 200, one of the two in 100 that, that, that survives the type of illness that I had. And so I feel, really feel blessed to be here today, and, and uh, I'm grateful to be alive, and it's exciting. And this is the first time I've led in worship in, in four years. So uh, it's a bit intimidating, but also... Uh, uh, I had confidence that, that God, uh, the God who carried me and brought me through 28 years in, in parish ministry would certainly abide and be with me uh, today. In 
Yeah, I was blessed enough as I thought about it um, uh, to give uh, Mindy away at John and Mindy's wedding. I was also blessed enough to uh, uh, take part. It was so close to the time I'd had the surgery and this and that, and uh, uh, I was barely able to, more or less in a way since, just to be here on their wedding day. But I got to give Mindy away. I got to um, take part in the wedding ceremony itself. And then the other thing that was uh, uh, joyous for me was I was able to uh, dance with Mindy and also then my wife and my other daughter, Lindsay, at uh, Mindy and John's wedding. What a, what a joyous uh, I was uh, like a cat with nine lives, you know. I, I didn't know if I was going to be here or not be here, and here I am, and there I was, and I danced with my daughter on her wedding day. Hallelujah. Now, about Charlie's uh, baptism today, or as I think about uh, Charlie, and, and uh, more specifically about uh, Charlie having been born, I had a, a rewind back. When, when Charlie was born, that was March the 21st of this year. But when she was born, it was kind of a rewind for me in terms of uh, remembering uh, Mindy having been born and also remembering having uh, Lindsay being born, our two daughters. And, and uh, there, there was that whole flashback to, to that, and it took me back to that time. And one of the uh, uh, aspects about that is uh, it was a, certainly a joyous and eventful time, uh, but also a bit daunting in terms of, you know, we, we, we gave birth uh, to our daughter, our first daughter, Mindy. We gave birth, and then uh, uh, we, we, we left the hospital and we took her home <laughs> and had the responsibility, you see, of, of caring for a child and my... Um, Mother-in-law came and stayed with us that first week, and everybody has their own ways and of dealing and coping. But but for us, that seemed to fit on that day. And and uh, my mother-in-law came home uh, with us uh, from the hospital when Charlie, I mean when Mindy w was born. I'm getting older when I start calling my granddaughter uh, by uh, my daughter's name, and uh, you know that whole cycle. And but uh, when when Mindy came home, there was something very interesting in that same week. Charlie was, uh, I mean, Mindy uh, was born on the eighth uh, of June, and uh, three days later, I was ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church. And so. Uh, uh, it takes a lot of dedication, commitment, a lot of study. Uh, you have to, you're, you're examined, uh, you go before the Board of Ordained Ministry. There's a lot involved in being ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church. Well, here, Mindy's born on the 8th. I'm being ordained a, a, a high, ecstatic, joyous period of time uh, in my life. And uh, uh, it all happened within a matter of three days, so a lot going on. And uh, I remember in order for me to be, be with the, the, uh, Mindy and, and her mother, in order for me to be there, uh, the bishop, Bishop Leroy Hodap, at the time asked me the examination questions for being an elder. That's part of the ordination process. And at that time, that was separated out in two different parts of, of, the, of uh, the annual conference. So one day you would have the examination questions, and then the, that night or the next day. And so Bishop Leroy Hodap uh, asked me the questions privately in terms of uh, the examination for an elder. So he asked me privately, uh, and one of the questions he asked, he said, uh, are you going on to perfection? That's basically the last question uh, that he asked me, and it's part of it. And, and I smiled, and I looked at him, and, you know, I'm thinking, am I going on to, to perfection? And I said, uh, I will with God's help. Amen. <laughs> That's the way we do it. 
We change, we grow, we grow, we change. We grow from grace to grace. And our whole life then is an adventure as we live in a relationship with the Christ. Well, there was one uh, aspect or one thing that was uh, particularly interesting uh, around that event. I asked uh, one of my mentors, a, a, a woman who was an elder, a good friend and a mentor, if she would baptize Mindy for me. And so uh, she agreed to do that, was willing to do that, and uh, there was a, a bit of a conflict and I had to backtrack just a little. Uh, uh, when at the church I was serving at the time, Mindy was born in 1986. But in 1984, I was introduced to the congregation. And when I was introduced to the congregation, uh, I was asked by the pastor parish committee that in 1984, two years prior to Mindy's birth and, and then later her baptism. But they said, uh, now in worship, are you planning on wearing a robe that day? And I thought, well, that's, is that a trick question? Uh, are you planning? On, and, and I thought, well, yeah, I kind of thought I might. Uh, I felt like I, I probably would. And, and they said, oh, no, no, that won't fly here. You can't, you can't wear a robe and worship. We, we don't want that. Uh, and so, you know, you're wanting to put your best foot forward. Uh, you know, the need for me to wear a robe, not wear a robe was not critical. And so I figured, uh, you know, pick and choose your battles. And I'll say, well, it's not necessary for me to wear a robe in worship for a couple of years there, then I didn't. But it came to Mindy's baptism, and then my friend uh, and mentor, uh, Doris, the two of us did the baptismal service for Mindy. And um, we wore robes that day. Uh, and uh, we wore robes because that was essentially what I had grown up with. And it made it more sacred and special to me. It doesn't, the robe doesn't mean that it is more sacred or special, but for me, I identified with that. So we wore our robes. And what was interesting about that is later then, a number of the people in the congregation said, you know, we think you should wear your robe every Sunday. <laughs> I didn't, but, but there was some growth on their part and growth on my part too. That, that's the way that played itself out. And then uh, re remembering uh, um, Mindy's baptism, uh, I also uh, thank God uh, for uh, my baptism, the covenant that my parents made on my behalf when I was an infant, and the congregation at that time, they also promised to live their lives in such a way until such time as this child, being me, uh, accepts Christ as Lord and Savior in their life. That was a critical and pivotal moment. We're not playing games, you know. I'm, I'm not diminishing that or whatever, but, but it's serious, a serious business when we commit to the notion that uh, we will live our lives in such a way until this person or this child before us accepts Christ as Savior and Lord. And that came into play for me later in life. Uh, my mother died when she was 20, and within two years later, uh, in less than two years, my father was killed by a drunk driver. And so uh, I would say or label that as, uh, uh, well, I was an orphan. Well, you know, 20, 21, 22, right in that window, loss of both parents. Well, he's old enough and mature enough to get along. He, that'll be fine, all that. But, but I was so, my own identity was so caught up in, 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 in terms of knowing who I was in connection with, with who my parents were. And so uh, that covenant that was made on their behalf was the one solid rock and something that I could come back to. And, and that relationship, uh, the faith in Jesus Christ and Christ who had resurrected from the grave and dealing with my grief and, and wondering how I'm going to uh, push through this grief and the like, uh, I was able and carried through that dark night, through my relationship 
that started when I was baptized as an infant and then therefore carried me forward uh, in and through that dark night of my soul. I was burdened and heavy laden with grief. We all are at times when we have losses. It's a time of transition. But at that time in my life, I thought, well, who am I now? My parents aren't here. Uh, I'm in seminary. I'm trying to figure out who I am. How do I identify who I am? Who am I now? And then that scripture that we uh, read this morning says, For as many as believe upon him, to them he gives them the power to become the children of God. And so for me, my identity, my ultimate identity was grounded in the notion that I am a child of God. I am one of the children of God. And so we all, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we identify with that and we, we, we become and we are the children of God. Hallelujah. What a, what an awesome, great, and extraordinary thing uh, to be uh, recognized and to claim ownership that we are the children of God. And if we are God's children, we identify with God's children as God's children. Come what may in life, whatever it is, we can see it through by the grace of God. Hear, hear. Well, prayer was a critical piece in my life at that time. And uh, on the campus where I was going to school, I, they had a prayer closet, and I would sneak in that prayer closet. I didn't want anybody to see me that I was going to slide in there. And the prayer was my lifeline to sanity as I was dealing with my grief and going through that dark night. And so I, I prayed a lot. I learned to pray. My mother prayed a lot. Uh, and she set that example and so as I was dealing with my grief and feeling overwhelmed and who am I and knowing that I'm a child of God, I, I would sneak into that prayer room and then they had a little closet inside of there and then I slid in there and closed the door. You could turn the light on if you want to or leave it off. And I most often just was in dark in this little closet. And I would reach out to God and pray unto the Lord and say, Lord, help me. I... I'm lost, I'm, I'm having difficulty uh, uh, processing and dealing with my grief and the like. Help me, O oh Lord. And in that moment, you know, my mind would race and race and race and race. And I'd find myself in that closet, my mind racing and racing and racing. And then I would settle down and calm down and enter into a a connection with God. There, there, I, I, I would uh, the the racing, 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 racing. It was kind of like a fasting, a fasting of the mind, where you just quiet down and enter into a a spiritual union with God, uh, where where the, the Christian tradition would call it like a mystical uh, type encounter with God, and it was through that encounter. And my understanding that I was a child of God for as many as believe upon him, to him or her, they shall become the children of God. I'm even at a loss for words now because God is unspeakable. We can't really share or tell just exactly. You know, words fail to, to describe the, the very essence and character of who God is. And, but I would enter into that, and that was the thing that the prayer was my lifeline to sanity. That covenant of my parents with me uh, was, uh, and, and the church, was an awesome, extraordinary gift that was bestowed. Uh, that, like what we did together this morning with Charlie, it's an extraordinary thing that we do and yeah we're human we do stupid stuff and stupid things and and the like and we're not all saints or whatever but what we do here collectively as the church whatever church it is uh, and, and we commit to 
to raising and nurturing our children in the faith is an awesome, extraordinary thing. And even when we do stupid stuff and the children call our hands on it or they wonder what in the world's going on with that person, be aware and know that you know you know that you're coming here and being here on Sunday morning and how you live your life throughout the week with that kind of consciousness and direction where you uh, seek well, to, to live, you know, in community and in fellowship and relationship with others uh, with a kind of God consciousness or a mindfulness that we're to have the mind which was in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Uh, I want to say one last thing, and if I've got, I know I've gone a little over time, uh, but uh, it needs to, I, I need to share just this last thought anyway. Uh, those months and years where I was so sick and recovering and, and, and uh, convalescing, I was in a survival mode, just kind of bent down and in almost like a fetal position, you know, just bent down and, you know, hunkered down and, I didn't, uh, being in a survival mode, I didn't hardly want to be with people or around people. I, I, I was just surviving. That's, that's all I could do. And, and uh, imagine this, I get to be here today, no longer in that hunkered down fetal position, but with arms wide open and stretched, embracing the light, embracing life, and embracing God, being thankful and grateful for the gift of life and the light and love of God in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen and amen.